Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Nuclear Energy Agency web chat. We will start with the Young Generation panel, chaired by Dr. Fiona Raymond, Executive Director of the United Kingdom National Nuclear Laboratory, Nuclear Innovation and Research Office. This will be followed by a leadership panel, chaired by NEA Director General William D. Magwood IV, with executives from regulatory, industry and research organisations. The leadership panel will be followed by an open discussion, during which we will be taking questions from anyone attending this webinar. People from around the world have registered to take part in this event to ensure a stable connection. And considering this large number of attendees, your video and audio functions have been disabled. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Magwood. Well, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this NEA web chat on gender balance. I'm Bill Magwood. I'm Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, these NAA web chats are a feature we have started during the uh, recent COVID-19 incident uh, that enable us to reach out to, uh, to all of you um, in, around the world and also to pull together key speakers and leaders to talk about important issues. Today we're going to talk about gender balance and this is an issue that has gained increasing prominence in the nuclear field in the last few years because there is a very um, interesting disparity in the number of women in uh, the nuclear field. Um, by the count of various organizations, we see that there's about 22% uh, of the engineers and scientists in the, nu uh, in the nuclear sector are female, uh, which is a very low number compared to many other um, industries and disciplines. And if you look at leadership level, uh, the numbers are even smaller. Um, we believe that this is a very important issue uh, for not just from the perspective of fairness, of equal opportunity for everyone, but it also has a big impact on the future prospects of the nuclear industry itself. And we're going to talk a bit about that today. I'm uh, very pleased to be joined by a panel of, by panels that will be composed of both um, young people who are new to the nuclear sector and a group of established leaders, which we'll talk to a bit later. Um, we intend to create a dialogue with all the panelists over the course of the, of the web event. And we will also in, look forward to encouraging a dialogue with you and the audience uh, through your questions and your comments. Um, I'm very pleased to be um, joined today by Fiona Raymond, who in addition to being with the UK National uh, Nuclear Laboratory and the leader in the skills area in the UK and the nuclear uh, field uh, is also a member of our steering committee. Um, and, and it's been a very important um, voice and leader in many of our policy activities. So I will now give the floor to Fiona who will take over for the first panel. Fiona. Thank you, uh, Director General Magwood. And thank you to the NEA for um, enabling this very important discussion today and bringing us all together at a time when it's so important for us to continue to have dialogue uh, when we're all um, separated from each other um, for uh, reasons that are not our own. Um, my role is very much um, now being an advisor uh, to a whole variety of, of different um, organisations um, and, and governments uh, on nuclear energy um, and policy. And I do that through my, um, through my role at the Nuclear Innovation and Research Office at the National Nuclear Laboratory. Um, but I've also had a passion for skills and an engagement on skills and skills challenges that we have throughout the years. And, and more recently, actually working very, very closely with a number of um, key people, both in the UK and internationally, on the diversity agenda, thought diversity. Um, so much, much broader than just gender diversity. Um, but gender diversity is a very, very important um, area for us to continue to progress as we take our whole nuclear agenda forward. So I've got a great lineup um, for you today. Um, I'm joined um, by young ladies um, from the nuclear sector um, who are all working um, in various aspects of the nuclear field. And what we're going to hear about today is, is basically how they got here, um, maybe why they actually chose nuclear, um, how, did it, how did it come about, um, and maybe what challenges they face. And the way that we're going to do that, we're going to run it as a, as a panel session. So you're going to hear from our, our presenters, first of all. 
um, and then we'll open it up to a, a Q&A. So I just ask people um, if you've got some specific questions, as Andrew said at the very start, um, if you could maybe just um, pose them on the chat um, and we'll, we'll collate these and I'll make sure that a, a number of these questions are actually uh, discussed as we take the, the panel forward. Um, so with, um, with no further ado, um, what I'd actually like to do is just introduce um, the panel um, to you. So we have four ladies um, from across um, the world um, who um, basically agreed to participate in this uh, dialogue today. Uh, we have Kate Peters, um, who's the Environmental Programme Officer for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, in Canada. We have Lucy Philpan, um, who is an engineer researcher at the Institut de Radio Protection um, et de Sûreté Nucléaire in France. We have um, Anastasia, Anastasia, sorry, um, Zerebelova, who's the pro project manager of uh, Rosatom's Technical Academy uh, in Russia. And we have Daniel Trembath, um, who is a safety case advisor at the National Nuclear Laboratory in the United Kingdom. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, open up the, the, the floor to each panellist um, in order to, to give their story um, and then we'll all come together and, and have that Q&A. So remember and get your questions in if you have any um, because we're, we're all ready to, to really have a really good discussion and, and dialogue here. Um, what I'm going to do as I introduce each of um, our panellists, I'm just going to also give you a bit of an interesting factoid. Um, that they have um, given us, because I just think it just helps with, uh, with the whole dialogue today. And I won't go through all of the CV or agenda or anything like that. They can tell some of their story in terms of where they've come from as they, as they talk that through um, today. So, um, first of all, I'm going to um, open up um, with uh, Kate Peters. And, and Kate um, actually has a, a very interesting factoid. Um, she actually studied brewing at the University of California and worked in the beer and wine industries um, and is now with us in nuclear. So isn't it really interesting in terms of um, when we start to talk about diversity? It's not just diversity in terms of gender diversity, but we actually also have diversity in terms of the range of backgrounds and topics that people have actually managed to um, partake in prior to even coming into our sector. So Kate, over to you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess, to many of you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, so I'll start from the beginning. In high school, I liked science, particularly physics and math, mainly because I was getting good grades, but I also enjoyed the problem-solving aspect of these courses. So when it came time to go to university, I chose chemistry because I found it the most interesting. I like the hands-on aspect and seeing and understanding chemical reactions was kind of exciting. I was lucky enough to take the co-op program, which meant I got a variety of work experience in the office, uh, in a research lab, and also doing some applied research. So I got to learn what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, it turned out chemistry was actually very gender balanced, and I had many female classmates, professors, and TAs. In my summer jobs, I actually had more female supervisors than male ones. One job I remember the most is in the photochemistry lab I worked in, and it was run by two women who were under 30. I think they were postdocs, and they had no problem telling the boys what to do and had the full support of our male professor. So this was good to see. When I graduated, I was planning to return to that lab to do a master's in chemistry the following September, but I decided to take a summer job in between my studies. After being unemployed for about a month, I was getting pretty desperate. So I was thinking of going back to the golf course where I had worked in high school and giving up on a summer job in science. And then the CNSC called me for an interview. I had applied to so many places, I had forgotten I even applied there. It looked interesting, but it wasn't really something I had sought out. I ended up getting the job and I worked in a systems engineering division with a group of highly technical engineers. I didn't know much about nuclear and I wasn't an engineer and this was quite intimidating but I was learning a lot and everyone was really nice to work with. Near the end of the summer, I was offered a contract extension, but this meant I wouldn't be able to do my master's in chemistry. I was afraid to, 
disappoint my supervisor at the university, but he was very understanding. I also found that the lifestyle and the pay were better at the CNSC. I learned through my co-op positions that I prefer applied sciences, and I think this is one of the reasons I'm attracted to nuclear. We're all working on tangible, real-world problems. I also found out I could take a course-based master's in chemical engineering, and this fit my interests better, so I was able to pursue that part-time while working. So now I was doing my master's and working, and things were going well. My first day in class, I found out that all of my classmates were male international students, or at least almost all of them, and they all already knew each other. It was difficult to fit in, and a very different experience from my undergrad. Another student at the CNSC happened to be in a lot of my courses, and he helped me with the transition to engineering. I gained a lot of confidence figuring things out on my own and continued to get good grades despite my, the change of my field of study. I even took a course in nuclear engineering, which was terrifying at the beginning, but turned out to be quite enjoyable. I kept getting contract extensions, but always for only three to four months, which was stressful. So I applied to over 50 jobs in 2012 and early 2013 and barely got any calls back. Eventually, I got another position at the CNSC doing personnel certification, which was primarily office work. Not really my thing, but I did get to go on an inspection to Bruce Power. It was the inspection of a written exam. It might have been the most boring five hours of my life, but I got a tour of Bruce Power and it was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. At that point, I was really sold on a career in this industry. I eventually moved to the CNSC lab as a laboratory and field technologist. This job involved taking samples around nuclear facilities all around Canada and helping prepare and analyze them in the lab. This was about halfway through my master's and I was able to change my focus of my courses to environmental engineering topics like air pollution, environmental assessment, and even found a course in radiochemistry, which really complemented the work I was doing. The job was advertised as up to 70% travel to perform the field work, which was very exciting. But I had never done field work before, so I decided I'd better read up on it. Field work is very hands-on, so a lot of my studying was done on YouTube. Every single video was a middle-aged man with a beard who occasionally had a younger male sidekick. It didn't really bother me until I found myself leading a sampling trip with three middle-aged men. So I'm there, I'm five feet tall, 24 years old, and I'm supposed to tell these guys what to do. And then two licensee staff, also men, were joining us. This was really intimidating. I learned quickly that my communication, organization, and planning skills were major assets for this work and gained the respect of many of my colleagues this way. This still hasn't stopped people from being surprised to see who's doing the field work. I have been referred to as that little girl in the big truck more than once and been told I'm doing a man's job, but usually followed up by the fact that I'm doing it well. A few years later, I had the opportunity to take on a bigger role in our program and I'm now the technical lead of the independent environmental monitoring program. I was no longer only responsible for planning trips and taking samples. Now I was responsible for many aspects of the program including reviewing the results, reporting, and working with the public and indigenous groups. I had a lot to learn, but I am proud to say that I feel competent and confident in my position, and it is largely thanks to some key role models and mentors I've had along the way, both male and female. I honestly think I have the best job in my whole department of over 800 staff. I get to spend the majority of my spring, summer, and fall working in the field with diverse teams of scientists and engineers as well as junior staff and students. I've gotten to see a lot of Canada and have made many professional relationships and friendships along the way. I've also met many, many members of the public and have taken on the role of more of a science communicator than anything. I realize this is a very important aspect of the nuclear industry. This aspect of my job has been the biggest source of satisfaction. I've been able to explain our work to many members of the public, friends and family, and it feels great when you know that they have left the conversation with a better understanding of our industry and significantly less fear. So that's my story from a shy chemistry student to a reluctant chemical engineer to an outgoing science communicator. My career has also been a big part of my personal development. And I'd like to thank everyone who has helped along the way, especially my colleagues and supervisor who encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone to give this talk.
Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Caden. What a, what a wonderful story. And uh, there's a, there's a lot, lot of um, aspects of that I want to come back and, and really kind of, um, talk to you about in, in more detail as we take this forward. So, so thank you very much. So now I'm going to um, give the floor um, to, to Lucy. And um, the, the fun fact um, that, um, that we have from Lucy is that she never thought that she would end up in nuclear. Um, in fact, obtained a bachelor's uh, degree in geology and then went on to get a master's degree in volcanology and then a PhD in hydrology um, and then found nuclear safety. Um, so um, here's a story that, that she can tell you around um, how she got to where she is today. So welcome Lucy and, and over to you. Um, thank you and good morning, good evening everybody. And thank you for inviting me to participate to this webinar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to share my experience with you. So I am Lucy Fulpin, I'm 29 and I have been working for three years in the French Institute of Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety, the IRSN. Um, just a few words about my background and how I ended up in the nuclear field. Um, just after my high school diploma, I went to college uh, to study earth sciences and I finally got a master's degree in volcanology. And then I realized that there were only a few jobs uh, linked to the volcanoes. So I decided to do um, a PhD in hydrology, which is much more common. And I spent uh, three years uh, of my thesis to study uh, extreme rainfalls and flooding risks. And after I graduated three years ago, I had to apply for jobs. And the truth is that um, at the beginning, I never thought I could work in the nuclear field. Uh, I didn't know that they were looking for engineers and researchers in the field of natural hazards. Um, I thought, as many people do, that uh, you had to be a doctor in physics to work there. Um, so I was looking for a job related to a natural hazard assessment, and I saw an offer in the IRSN. Uh, they were looking for um, someone to evaluate external hazards, and particularly extreme temperatures and external floodings uh, close to the nuclear power plants. Uh, finally, I applied for this job because it was related to what I wanted and I was especially curious and uh, attracted by the nu nuclear aspect. Uh, it seemed to be a very exciting job with many challenges. Um, in fact, um, there are um, if there are any nuclear accidents, as we saw, uh, for instance, in Fukushima, the consequences can be devastating. And for me, it is much more uh, challenging and necessary to study uh, the flooding risk close to the nuclear power plant than studying the flooding risk, for instance, in a region where there is almost nobody. And I finally got this job and I enjoyed it. And after one year, I had the opportunity to do a postdoctoral research in the same field and still in the IRSN. Uh, and during my postdoc, I took part of a um, European research project in the nuclear field. And I met many members of the um, nuclear community in Europe. And I realized uh, during the different workshops of this project that there were a wide range of research area in the nuclear. And well, I also realized that in this European project, uh, there are only a few women, I don't know, maybe 10% of women, contrary to the number of men. So sometimes it's not, it was not easy to speak up and to assert myself in this environment. But at the end, at the end of my postdoc, uh, a few months ago, I was offered an engineer researcher position in the same uh, IRSN team. And today I spend um, half of my time working on expertise and half um, continuing my research 
which is very exciting to me because um, I like to diversify my activities. And at the beginning, the expertise was quite uh, complicated because uh, the nuclear field was a very new thing for me. It was complicated to speak during meetings with people from the nuclear industry or other institutions um, because people seem more, um, much more skilled than me. But finally, I realized that uh, these people were from the nuclear field and I was here to bring my knowledge on natural hazards. And I also realized that um, in my team, almost no one was a professional of the nuclear field at the beginning. Uh, we all learn little by little through training, for instance. And as I am in a small team, uh, it's very easy to speak with the others and to share knowledge and experiences. Um, regarding the research side, I'm very happy to have the time to continue my research. and. And I have also the time to supervise uh, internships, uh, which is very important to me. Actually, I'm very interested in supervising and sharing what I learn with young students. It's very rewarding for me when the students feel comfortable and they want to find a job in the same field than me. And we are like, uh, finally, we are like other institutions. We work with many different organization, different people with different skills and background, and not all linked to the nuclear. Maybe before the nuclear was, the world of nuclear was more closed with a majority of men, but today I, I feel it is changing, or in any case in France. For instance, in my team, we are more women than men, and we have different backgrounds. And I think most people have a bad knowledge of the nuclear field, you know, when when you meet people, new people uh, on an event or I don't know where, and you speak with them about everything, and there is always this question, what is your job? And with some people, the simple mention of the word nuclear afraid them. They only think to the nuclear accidents and not to the good things. And sometimes it's a lack of awareness and perhaps with more communication of the companies, um, they will change their mind maybe with more discussion, partnerships with everybody, and especially with the youngest people, and without making any differences of uh, background or gender, uh, we will be able to change this. Thank you so much. Um, I think there is um, there's, there's a there is a real need to continue to have the dialogue in a whole variety of areas in terms of um, you know what you've just talked about there, and we'll come back and explore that um, as we as we get onto the panel. So thank you for that. Um, so now um, we're going to move to our next panelist, and our next panelist is um, Anastasia. And um, the fun fact here um, from from Anastasia is that she actually started her career in the cradle of the Russian nuclear industry. Because in fact, on June the 27th, 1954, um, the, one of the, the nuclear power plants there started uh, operations, um, allegedly as one of the first nuclear power plants that actually were set up to generate electricity uh, for the grid. And, um, and Anastasia um, basically um, was, was um, able to see um, what happened looking back at history um, as a result of that. So she started a career um, basically um, in that cradle of the industry. So Anastasia, over to you. Uh, let's hear your story. Um, hi everyone. Thank you, Fiona. You expanded a lot on my fun fact about me. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Margaret and Dr. Fiona Raymond for having me here. It's a great honor for me to join my fellow panelists in representing the industry we all love. I find your stories incredibly inspirational, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to communicate and reach such a wide audience and nuclear leaders, notwithstanding the current situation and social distancing. My name is Anastasia Zerebilova. I'm from Russia, and I'm 27 years old. I work for Rosatom Technical Academy, Rosatom Tech for short, for almost five years. And Rosatom 
is Russia's state-owned nuclear corporation and the only company in the world that provides products and services across the entire nuclear fuel cycle, starting from uranium mining and enrichment to decommissioning. We also provide solutions on the whole number of non-energy sectors of nuclear, as well as renewable energy, new materials, storage and logistics, and so on. And Rosatom Technical Academy is one of over 400 enterprises within Rosatom Corporation. And our job is to help countries that are just embark on nuclear power to build their nuclear infrastructures. And we do so by provision of high quality training programs on nuclear infrastructure issues and non-power nuclear and radiation technologies applications. In my current role as a project manager, I work on the implementation of different training projects together with the International Atomic Energy Agency and other international organizations. I uh, have a master's degree in computer science, um, but even at the un university, I harvest my interest in nuclear and my bachelor and master's thesis were on probabilistic safety assessment of nuclear power plants. Previously, I've undertook a one-year internship program at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Prosection. INPRO stands for International Project on Innovative Nuclear Reactors and Fuel Cycles. And this project in section at the agency was established 20 years ago, just at the beginning of the 21st century, with the recognition that this century promises the fastest pace of technological development in history and the largest expansion of energy sector. That is why one of the intersection goals was to enable a nuclear energy sustainability. Uh, being an intern, I worked on different collaborative projects of intersection and develop analytical tools in order to achieve intersection goals. Um, so why nuclear? Um, it's evident that uh, life and development are impossible without energy. And nowadays, we clearly see that choices of every one of us regarding energy do matter. And I have a strong opinion that every human life touches thousands of other lives in different ways, and those lives then touch thousands of lives further on. And working in nuclear and for nuclear, I'm making my own small, small but measurable contribution to satisfying energy needs in developing countries, as well as combating global warming and climate change. Because nuclear is a reliable and low carbon energy source. To put it in perspective, on average, all of Russian designed nuclear power plants, and I'm actually, uh, right in one of them, thanks to the Zoom background behind me, it's called a nuclear power plant. So uh, all Russian nuclear power plants across the world prevent emissions of about 210 million tons of CO2 annually. And do you know how many trees are needed to absorb this much CO2? Actually a lot, almost 33 million hectares of forest. And that's three times all the woods on the territory of Germany, for example. But Nuclear is so much more than energy production. Radioisotopes and radiation technologies uh, have essential uses across multiple sectors, including food and agriculture, scientific research, transport, healthcare, environment, art. And we've seen how instrumental nuclear has been in the fight with coronavirus. Not only has it been a stable and reliable supplier of baseload power, it also helped with sterilization of personal protective equipment, the way we have done it in Russia and was diagnosing and monitoring the disease. So with every project I accomplish, I became more certain and dedicated that I was absolutely right about my career choice. And it's important to point out that uh, Russian nuclear industry historically uh, is kind of a part of our national collective identity. And by the way, this year it celebrates its 75th anniversary. So Rosatom is something that can be called a love brand back home, uh, similar to Amazon or Google of Russia from the HR perspective. And it's very well known, respected, consistently making a top employer rankings. Uh, so there's very little confusion about what industry I'm involved in from my friends and peers outside nuclear. I find their feedback supportive and validating. Uh, so what nuclear job brings to the table for me? I'm a very mission-driven individual and nuclear allows to combine very versatile skill set that I have. Um, there is an expression in Russian that can be roughly translated uh, into English as 
there is a why in what I do. And becoming a leader in the industry is an inspiring perspective for me because it's professional growth with an added layer of meaning. And of course, I don't want to stand still where I am. And I always reflect on the concept of leadership. And to me, leadership and creativity or creative potential go hand in hand because the concept of leadership is always changing. And we're not longer talking about leaders who just supervise their subordinates. A leader is a person who can ignite a spark. And it's especially important, I think, for future leaders to find creative ways to solve different issues and meet social, economic, technological challenges in an agile way. And I'm a strong believer that there is an opportunity in every adversity. So unfortunately, nuclear industry as any large scale industry can be sometimes a little bit conservative, but growth doesn't happen in comfort zones. So to me, the biggest challenge would be to have no challenges at all, actually. And to enable my professional eminence, nuclear industry has done for me a lot already. And now I feel like it's my turn to give to giving it back and to enable my success and realization as, as human being living in clean and sustainable world where everyone has access to energy. Nuclear just needs to be. And I would like to leave us with a great quote from Albert Einstein, which I modified a little bit for the purposes of this web chat. Um, try not to become a man or woman of success but rather try to become a man or woman of value. And Nuclear provides me with this opportunity. And that is what inspires me to do more and be more. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so much um, passion and enthusiasm um, for, the, for the sector there. And um, I love the um, analogy of Amazon. And, um, and then looking at the, the role of nuclear and how that could play. So thank you for that. So we'll come back and talk about some of this in more detail um, during the, the panel. So now I'd like to move to our, um, our final um, panellist um, within this panel. Um, and I'd like to introduce everybody to Danielle. And I know that you're all waiting for the interesting uh, fact, fun fact or factoid um, in this case. So Danielle's um, interesting facts. Um, was is actually that um, when she was seven years old, um, she actually appeared in the local newspaper. And the reason she appeared in the local newspaper was because she'd actually written a letter to the UK Prime Minister at that time, John Major, asking him to take action to stop deforestation um, because it would actually help the environment. And she actually received a letter back from him, um, from his office um, at that time. So um, obviously um, somebody who believes in actually not just sitting back and watching, but actually doing something about it. So Danielle, over to you and your story. Hello, um, uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name's Danielle Tenbass um, and I currently work in Cumbria for the National Nuclear Laboratories Safety Care Supervisor. Um, so I get to work with and implement changes to the safety case. Um, I'm sure everybody knows, but not. Not everybody does, but it's a, a body of evidence that, that says why the site and the operations that take place on it are safe for everybody, um, including the environment and the public. So it's a very interesting role. Um, but my route into this role was not direct. Um, during my GCSE and A-level period, um, my best subjects were literature, history and design, so nothing to do with uh, science and technology. Um, and I, I grew up in Cumbria um, and it was my experience that girls were encouraged into college to study roles as an example kind of like in the beauty industry or traditionally roles that maybe necessarily wouldn't make you a breadwinner um, and I felt, felt like the boys were encouraged into um, the apprenticeships which were dominated by um, the nuclear industry being from Cumbria. Um, but I knew this wasn't for me. Um, so these factors and wanting to experience life a little bit less rural meant that um, I left Cumbria to do my undergraduate degree. Um, at that time, at the age of 18, I want, had ambitions of working in government. Um, so I studied international relations and politics. Um, I was achieving good grades, um, but I also uh, was lucky enough to have very influential and good tutors. 
um, and one in particular suggested the idea of taking study further to a master's level. Um, yeah, he kind of said that you need to make yourself stand out in whatever field you go into um, mm -hmm. and hard work and higher, you know, higher education um, is a way to do that. So um, I applied to study intelligence and international security um, at a really good university in London. Um, but the pass mark to gain entry was a 2-1, which I achieved. Um, but after finishing my degree and waiting for the letters to come through to say start dates, etc. Um, but due to oversubscription, they refined the pass mark to um, the upper end of a 2 1, so it was like over a 65, um, which I didn't. I had a 63, um, so I was unfortunately denied my place at that time. Um, and when I received that notification, I was currently, I'd finished my degree. I was working 70 hours a week on, in, a, in a fish factory <laughs> um, on a graduate management scheme. Um, so it felt like my, my plans to move to London and, and you know, have this amazing career in government just had come to a, an abrupt end. Um, but rather than accept that, I contacted the, my lecturers who were really well thought of in their field for references on my work and behaviour during my studies. Um, and I wanted to show that I had more to offer than just a, a lower end to one <laughs> and that I wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, and I was successful. So um, I managed to leave to study for London in London in that year um, at this university. Um, I still had no plans to work in the nuclear industry. <laughs> Instead, I wanted to use my education to start working for security services um, in the government. But unfortunately, at this time, the most common routes that all my peers were taking um, into opportunities were unpaid. Um, and that just wasn't an option for me. Um, sorry, it's the two one is that like a, if a degree was a, it, a first was an A, a two one is like a B, and then two two is like a C. So I essentially achieved like a lower grade B. Um, but yeah, so I wasn't going to be able to take unpaid work, um, but I still had ambition, still wanted to use my education. And then I thought, well, the nuclear industry um, is the way forward for me. Um, so I moved back to Cumbria, first of all, working for an IT company that provided support to the nuclear estate and then um, left there to go to an, a recruitment agency. Um, who work, I was a, a supervisor work dealing with personnel security for the nuclear industry. Um, while I enjoyed this job, I did get more insight into what goes on in the field um, and recruitment was winding down. So um, it was not really what I had in mind for my future. Um, I had been exposed to NNL through these roles. Uh, I knew it was a good company to work for with opportunities and seeing this as a fresh start for me. Um, I joined the NNL admin team, um, which which was, was a good role. Um, and during this role, I was able to support in other projects, security projects, role, roles that were just a bit more meaty to get myself involved in um, and showed a bit more potential. Um, and at this time, the safety case team um, were looking for someone who they could train up because there aren't many people in safety case so um, they were looking for somebody to train up who necessarily didn't have relevant experience and um, because I had shown that I had potential um, I was viable for this um, and it was a challenge that would provide responsibility in a company at the forefront of nuclear science um, which was really appealing for me um, and even though it feels like it's been a long journey to get to this stage in my career, um, mm -hmm. I do feel like I'm just at the start um, and it's very exciting what I feel like the mm -hmm. future is going to be. So that's how I got into nuclear. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Danielle. And again, another great story of um, tenaciousness in terms of actually continuing to do what you feel is the right thing to do. Um, despite 
um, what's happening around you. And I think there's there is a bit of you know we hear that throughout the the whole of the discussion today in terms of the the various panelists in terms of being very clear in terms of actually what they'd like to achieve. Well, now we're going to move everybody to the the panel session, and we have a bit of time um, where we're just going to explore some of this in more detail. And, Thank you so much for um, for sending in so many questions. Um, we have loads of questions here um, to take a look at. So I'm just going to start uh, by maybe just um, picking some of these and and actually asking some questions of our panelists. And um, so the first one I actually have is for Kate. Um, so um, and this one is actually just um, around you, and and actually asking um, the question of um, do you find that time spent on science communication and outreach detracts from the time that you actually have to spend in technical tasks and, and basically how do you manage that? Thanks for the question. Um, I think that is a pretty relevant concern, um, especially for all of us working in more technical fields. Um, but for us, the independent environmental monitoring program is meant to be a program that offers assurance to the public that the nuclear facilities in Canada are operating safely and not harming the environment. So that public outreach aspect is actually really key to our program. Um, so it is equally important to be doing the technical work, but also to be communicating that back to the community, because that is the whole purpose of the program. So we have uh, an interactive online dashboard where all the results are posted so anyone can see. Uh, when we're out in the community, we're wearing, you know, CSE, CNSE sweaters. We have a branded tent where everyone can see, you know, who is that and what are they doing. And we do get a lot of questions from the public. And I probably spend an equal amount of time taking samples as I do answering those questions. Uh, a lot of our sampling locations are in public parks, at beaches, boat launches, places where the community is living and doing their recreational activities. So we run into a lot of people and spend a lot of time chatting with them. And I think that really is what makes the program is that we're out there in the community spending time on that. So as it, it does take away a little bit of your time from technical things, but for us, that is the purpose of what we're doing. Thank you. That's that's great. And 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 one for for Lucy, um, really um, a question um, from the audience asking how IRSN works closely with students um, and and how you actually supervise students um, going forward, and how you conduct collaborative research with academic institutions. Would would you care to comment on that, Lucy? Um... Yeah, in the IRSN, every year uh, we offer uh, internships uh, for uh, engineer school, or there are also internships for uh, young uh, students or for um, uh, very young students, and they spend uh, one week in IRSN and they can learn what is nuclear and everything, and the internships for the engineers. Um, it's six months and they are still with us and I don't know for example last year uh, I there was a woman and she studied the flooding risk with me and uh, she made everything as me but uh, I learned to her how to do and everything and it's, I love to do this and for the um, um, collaboration with the others. Uh, it depends, uh, for example, if we need um, something related to meteorological events, we are going to ask to Meteo France uh, to collaborate with them and we have to many organizations and it depends what, uh, what we need. That's great, thank you. Um, and, and here's one maybe for, for Anastasia. Um, really um, thinking through um, the, um, the, the nuclear sector um, and maybe thinking through whether there's more male leaders than female leaders. Um, so the question is, in your organization, 
um, are there more male leaders than female leaders? And, and, and in your view, how could we attract more women to join the nuclear industry and maybe have more women as leaders of nuclear organizations? Thank you for the question. Actually, uh, Russian nuclear industry and Vasatom is pretty gender balanced. Uh, women occupy about 30% of executive and managerial positions at Rosatom and in Russia total, uh, according to Grant Thornton report, women occupy about 40% of uh, leadership positions. As for my organization, um, my International Center for Nuclear Infrastructure, we have 40% uh, of women and 60% of men. So we're I think we're pretty gender balanced. Of course, there is a room to grow, but we are uh, taking steps to achieve progress in this area. Uh, Rosatom has a lot of uh, mentoring programs and talent pipelines. Uh, Rosatom works with more than 400 kindergartens, more than 200 um, elementary schools. And uh, I think that as for younger people, for um, young students and kindergarten children, we should, of course, raise awareness um, and disseminate information about technical subjects, about the possibilities. Uh, and as for uh, adult, adults, for example, gradu young graduates, we should, of course, uh, offer women a more flexible working solution because uh, they should somehow combine uh, professional life with family and maybe to entertain them, to provide them very flexible gender policies at their organizations. And I think also role models and mentors are very important. Um, mentors can be like any gender, I think, but for role models, of course, we need more women as a role models. So, yeah. That's great, thank you. And I, I completely agree that um, on role models, um, I, guess, um, I guess what we're doing today, we're, we're all kind of putting ourselves out there. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it's not always an easy thing to do, but um, um, I think that um, being able to do this and actually giving that visibility um, helps with this whole dialogue. And um, we are seeing that with a number of questions coming in. Um, and so, yes, I completely agree with that. Thank you, Anastasia. And, and over to Danielle. Um, so, so one of the questions that we have here is just around when ki kids or teenagers ask the question, um, should they consider a career in the nuclear field? Um, what, what would you tell them and why? Um, well, got, when I worked in recruitment, we often used to go out to schools um and d discuss possible career options um and we always used to get the typical of like girls wanted to be like you know famous and and boys always wanted to be a bit more practical with their careers um so i would say the nuclear industry is so varied that there's regardless of what your skills or ambitions and or talents are there is a role for everybody um it's got a lot to offer in each individual um discipline if you like um so i would say it's a very rewarding um field to go into and just got to keep pushing rather than getting complacent in you in your career that's what i would say yeah i think that's that's a that's a that's a very good point just in terms of how you would uh, approach that and take it forward and actually I guess part of it again is around the visibility I think there's we've had a few comments through just around the fact that um there's a there's a, a recognition here that that a number of the panelists here um didn't actually kind of find themselves in nuclear in the first instance they they came across it so so one of the things I'd actually just like to explore maybe with all of you um very quickly um in terms of your mm -hmm. thoughts actually around um you know what do we what, what can we do here in terms of actually getting more visibility um out there um to people around the the whole um variety of roles that you can actually do within the nuclear sector because quite quite obviously you're all quite passionate about it you're all heavily engaged in it and you're, you've got good jobs in terms of taking it forward 
but in, in, in some cases it wasn't actually what you thought you would do up front. So um, I'm just interested in, in anybody's views in terms of what we should be doing here. Anybody like to start? Okay, so over to Anastasia. I think it's great to conduct such events like any international mentoring workshops. Uh, and of course, I think we should make use of digital transformations and to conduct more web chats, webinars like this. And I know that international organizations in new client national organizations uh, have like a lot of mentoring programs, uh, mentoring program, international workshop and NEA and International Atomic Energy Agency mentoring program for interns and young uh, GPOs and young consultants. But uh, in Rosatom, we also have the industry-wide um, online portal for young students and graduates where they can find all the available information on uh, Rosatom Corporation, available positions for internship, available positions for to take position in the nuclear field, but maybe we could unify our efforts in attaining more people, more women in nuclear field by creating some um, joint international uh, portal, something like becoming a nuclear professional where people can find information about uh, universities with specializations in nuclear, on all the nuclear organizations with the possibilities for internships, with a list of events available for young people and graduates. And of course, with information maybe for parents, because uh, influence of parents on their children is, uh, is very high. And um, maybe we should work also with the whole family, with parents and children, because sometimes parents set different roles for boys and girls just from their childhood. So that is um, what I think could be a very nice idea to do together. I think that's, that's great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so um, one other question that, that, I, that I have that's come in a couple of times um, from the audience um, is really just about um, really trying to understand whether you've actually experienced any sort of injustice um, within your career, within the nuclear field as a result of, of being a woman. Um, so um, there's just a question here around, uh, you know, um, is there anything that, that, that you actually have experienced here? And, and what did you do about it in terms of actually exploring that? And I know we've heard that a little bit in the presentations because for example, um, Kate actually talked about um, being, I think the, the actually looking at the quote, you actually, you were, you were basically told that the, there was a bit of unconscious bias going on here because somebody told you that you were doing a man's job, but were, was actually doing it well. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, how you feel about that and um, how, do, how, how do you react to things like that? I think that's a useful um, dialogue to, to have with people out there. So um, I don't know if maybe Kate, you want to start or somebody else? Um, yeah, I Kate. Um, I honestly haven't had that much real injustice, but as you said, there's still that unconscious bias present. Um, and even from women from older generations just seem surprised to see someone like me out in the field doing that kind of work. Um, but I find usually once you talk to these people, once they see that it's no different, they honestly look very proud to see a young woman doing what they call a man's job. And that's inspiring. I think sometimes it just takes an example for them to realize that, you know, it doesn't always have to be a man doing this type of work. Um, in terms of my colleagues, they've all been very supportive and I've had a lot of very helpful male mentors um, who have never acted any differently that I'm a woman. Um, so it's just those little things that are still present. Thank you, Kate. Um, anyone else? No, okay. uh, Danielle. Yeah, Danielle. Um, I think the injustices that you possibly find in the workplace that aren't necessarily always a nuclear specific issue. It's more about how women are perceived in society. And that's how my experience has been anyway. And I kind of feel like there's 
on a daily mm. basis, mm. many assumptions made, um, or tr- you know, you get treated in a certain way that you you know you wouldn't be if you were male or one of your male colleagues. Um, and I actually think it's up to us. I, I appreciate everyone's an individual, but to kind of like be the best example of yourself um, and not um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not not be a stereotype, but be a strong individual um, to kind of like show people that not all women do this, not all women are like this. Um, so I I do I do think there are, there are injustices, but it's more of a societal thing rather than nuclear. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Danielle. And I think that's a very important point that it's not just about nuclear; it's actually about a societal thing in in general. Okay, so we're coming to the very very end of our panel. So um, we're about to close this. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually just ask our panelists if, if they have the last word. Some of them might have some words that they want to show on the screen um, in terms of um, just letting people know um, basically what their thoughts are around this particular subject and the one takeaway that actually uh, you'd like the, the audience to take away um, from this panel session. So I'm either going to give you the opportunity to have the last word if you want um, or just show the sign. So um, over to our panelists. Anastasia. Um, yeah, I'd like to show a sign, the message I've prepared for the young women. So um, please create your own story in the STEM field or nuclear field. And also I'd like to say that uh, my advice is for young women and girls, just uh, don't be afraid, everything is possible. And I really like the quote from Marie Curie, uh, nothing in life is to be feared. It is to be understood, and now is the time to understand more so we can fear less. So don't be afraid, everything is possible, be curious. Thank you, Anastasia. And okay, so Lucy. Um, I just want to say be yourself and do not hesitate uh, to do what you want and what you love. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's an absolutely good point. And Kate? Um, I just like to remind young women that they can also be role models and mentors. It doesn't matter how old you are or if you're already in the field, um, that you can make a difference in the lives of people younger than you at any time. Thank you, Kate. And Danielle? Um, I would say that um, my mantra has been that your a comfort zone is not your friend, kind of similar to what Anastasia was saying in her story. And if something scares you, then it's probably the right thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, staying in a comfort zone doesn't do you any favours and knockbacks are just an opportunity to, to grow. Thank you, Danielle. So hopefully you'll all agree that this is an inspirational, knowledgeable, passionate and capable panel of our leaders for the future. Um, it's been absolutely great to talk with you. I know that we're going to come back um, very soon um, with the leaders panel. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, basically hand over to Director General Magwood, who's now going to take forward the leaders panel and then we'll all come together later. Thank you very much, Fiona, and um, thank my, my thanks to the panel. You're an outstanding a group of, um, of professionals and looking forward to talking with you um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so we now will move on to the leaders panel, and um, I'm very pleased to have this uh, assemblage of people, uh, people that I have worked with and engaged with, and if they all will come on screen now, I'll, I'll introduce them uh, very, very briefly. Um, so we'll be joined with a uh, Adrienne Kelby, who is the Chief Executive of the United Kingdom's Office for Nuclear Regulation. Um, I'll say a few words about her when she, before she speaks. Um, also, we have uh, Marie-France uh, Berlin, who is the Chairperson of the Board, the French Institute of Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety, IRSN, and also Professor of Radiology at paris Saclay University. Right? And um, last but not least, uh, Marilyn Cray, who is president of the American Nuclear Society, um, which, um, which I'm sure she'll, she'll introduce very briefly as she, when she speaks. 
<clears throat> so I'm, I'm very pleased to have all of you uh, with us today. We're, we're going to hear first uh, from Adrian Kelby. Um, and uh, Adrian, who is uh, one of the most fun people to be around that I know, um, but may, may make note of the fact that, um, that one area where, where women are, seem to be doing very well um, is in leading nuclear organizations, uh, nuclear, nuclear regulatory organizations. And of, of, the, of the major um, three English-speaking nuclear regulators in the world, um, in the UK, Canada, and the United States, they're all run by women. And I understand the three of you talk quite frequently, so maybe you can share some of your thoughts uh, as you go, as you open, as you open this up right now. So thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much, everybody. I am coming to you from my apartment, uh, which is in Liverpool, somewhere in the middle of the UK. It's a beautifully sunny day, and I think I'm in about week ten of lockdown. So it's genuinely a pleasure to see some different faces on here uh, than my own. Um, so I think we've got about seven minutes just to have a little chat and, and the world, I guess, as I see it. So um, that'll include a bit about what I've done, how I got here, some very strong beliefs I hold, and um, a few kind of um, outraged feelings. So I'm going to start with the outrage. You know, how can it be that over 200 work years since the Industrial Revolution, uh, there are still countries where women can't go to university, they can't vote, and they absolutely cannot lead an organisation? So this is the context into which I think gender balance spaces. And to be clear, I am a proponent of equality, inclusion and diversity in all its forms, but we are talking about women today and I happen to be one. So my view is that it is very clear that throughout history, women have what it takes to do any role they so choose. Yes, we may need a little help to get there because there are some stereotypes and there are some different barriers, but I believe that is also the same for men who wish to be in professions which are seen to be feminine. So let's just cut all that rubbish out and decide that people should be encouraged to be their best, biggest, boldest self and do what it is that they were put on this earth to succeed and to thrive in. I'll tell you a little bit about my history and what I think I'm here for. Um, but here's a few stats just before we kick off. The World Economic Forum has said recently that it's gonna be about the year 3000 before there is gender parity in the UK workforce. And we think we're relatively okay with this stuff. The depressing thing is that that's gone backward in the last few years. This is just ridiculous and it is unacceptable. Only 4% of the top 100 power and utility board members are female. And over two thirds of UK power and utilities company have not one woman on their board. This is unacceptable. So I'll have a chat about what I think we can do about it. Um, I, like many of the women here, I feel really at comfort, kind of comfort zone about this, don't and um, didn't want to be in nuclear per se. Uh, I grew up dreaming of being a show jumper. Uh, my mum and dad were crazy enough to buy me a pony around about the age of 11 or 12, and I loved horses. So I dreamed of going into that line of work. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay very well and you don't get to eat a lot. So I changed my mind at around about 18. Um, unlike you, I, I haven't been to university, uh, certainly for a, a standard degree. I went to college and I dropped out of that after my first year because I found it boring. And um, since then, uh, that would be about the age of 18, so quite a while ago now, I have been a, a personal assistant. I've been a secretary, a HR administrator, a trainer, a training coordinator, an operations manager, an operations director, a deputy chief executive, and an actual chief executive more than once. I have changed sectors six times. All of my last four jobs have been in different sectors, and many of them have been in different cities. So I think that um, also size, I've worked with teams that were 40 strong and teams that were seven and a half thousand strong. So I would say that my experience is pretty diverse. And if I can do it, frankly, anyone can do it. Nuclear isn't what I expected. I was told not to take this job by many people who knew me. They told me it would be, and I quote, dull. And I really don't do dull. You've probably figured that out already. But it's been an absolute joy because what runs through my veins through all of these jobs is the notion of being valuable, of being valued, and of very much in the last 30 years, public service. 
And I don't think there are many more important public service roles than making sure that the public are safe in a nuclear environment. And I feel very strongly about that. Um, it's been fun. It's been exciting. The people that I work with are far more diverse than when I started just four years ago. ONR has recruited 78% um, more female specialists in the last uh, three years. We've recruited three to every one man in the last four years. This is not through positive discrimination. This is not because I am ruling men out. It is because we are changing the way we recruit. We are changing the way we promote the organization and we're changing the way people perceive our roles. And for me, this is my number one tip. Role models change the world. I love what you said earlier, panelists, about being role models. We are the ones who have to be the change. If we constantly show grey reports with white middle-aged men as our only pictures, all looking very serious, clearly that doesn't appeal to people who may want a more colourful working environment, who may not necessarily be pro-nuclear, but are absolutely pro-interesting careers. And therefore, I think we have to consider the imagery, the branding, the wording, and our behaviour as an inviting open door through which women can and do walk. ONR is living proof of that. The second thing for me, I think, is about comfort zones. When I consider how schools and universities work, bearing in mind, I did go to school, but I didn't go to university. It really, really irritates me that there are so few women professors in engineering in particular, but not just in engineering. It also frustrates me that women drop out far more under male professors than they do under female professors. There is a difference in our brains, there is a difference in our learning styles. And I think the universities should be ashamed of themselves, frankly, at not grappling with this issue and tackling it at the root source. We need more diversity in the tutors and in the professors and in the research fellows to drive home this message that really learning is for everyone, no matter what the subject, just as it is if a man wants to learn a subject seen perhaps as feminine, like nursing. We need to make those gender neutral. Other things I would say we can do in schools, teachers generally don't know about this stuff. So ONR is involved in a great deal of STEM work, uh, ambassadorial work around science, technology, engineering and math. Many of my staff give up their own time to go and talk to school children, to inspire them in our local area to come and join us. Again, it comes back to me for role models. We need to show young children what this is like and we need to encourage girls especially to know that it's okay to do what they think are the geeky subjects. We need to show them these amazing women like Ada Lovelace and Marie Curie who changed the world, not just their careers. And a third thing perhaps for me, I would say is that um, we go right back then to parents. Uh, most of you will be parents at some point. Most of you will know some parents in your friends. The more we can have this constructive dialogue about great jobs, about really rewarding careers, no matter what your view of nuclear, then the more people will be open to enjoying that conversation with the children. If you don't know it exists, if we don't talk about it outside, then people will choose easier and more visible careers. So I need to stop now, but I'm gonna just change with one other thing. Your comfort zone is not your friend. If we're not prepared to step out of our comfort zone in Leeds, we can't expect anybody else to. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. And I, I think you've made several points that I'm, I'm sure we'll want to talk about a little bit further when we open the discussion. Um, so let me now move the floor to uh, Mary France, um, who will give us a, a talk from her perspective. And uh, Mary, Mary France is under, is, is, uh, is what is, it very admirable in being the only panelist who was not growing up speaking English. Uh, so, so thank you uh, very much for participating today. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you for the invitation to participate in uh, the webinar. I'd like also to thank uh, the young uh, generation for panelists 
because uh, because they have uh, presented very different sets of experiences and they have uh, all of them being of interest and uh, they have shown the diversity of the activities of the posts that can be offered in the nuclear uh, and research sectors so as a senior if i had advices to give to them uh, that would be remain optimistic and enthusiastic these are the uh, characteristics of youth and of, uh, of youth but uh, uh, be passionate and uh, the most important maybe is to remain confident confident in your capacities uh, to accomplish uh, your goals. I'd like now to say a few words about uh, my, uh, my own uh, career, the challenges that I had to face and uh, the great moments and uh, uh, my mentors. Uh, when I was uh, young, I was interested in sciences. Uh, then after the death of my father at the age of 16, I, uh, I thought that uh, biology and, uh, and uh, medicine could be uh, a good option for me. And I did my medical studies and then I became a radiologist. And I uh, chose to be a researcher just because I loved research, because I was initiated to research as a student and I loved it. And, uh, and it is a passion. And uh, as a radiologist, uh, I was involved in radiation protection. And uh, this is probably why two years ago, I, uh, I was asked to become the chairperson of the board of the IRSN. So during my life, my professional life, of course, I had great moments. I remember uh, the day uh, the day when I received uh, the acceptance of the first paper uh, that I wrote and was, that was going to be published in Radiology, which is the top uh, scientific journal in my discipline. And uh, this was great. I had also to face challenges as probably uh, all women here. Uh, the first one, when I was a child, I was rather shy, quiet. And uh, the te well, my teacher told my parents, well, uh, you sh that I should interact more with, uh, with other children at school. And uh, that, uh, well, uh, if I didn't, I would probably have to go and see uh, a psychologist. So I did tremendous efforts to speak, uh, to share activities and this, uh, I, remind, I remember this and this probably also helped me uh, during my profession life. Second challenge that I had to face, of course, was when I had my son and uh, it was not easy to reconcile the education of a, of a, of a child, uh, my, uh, my uh, residency and that of my husband. Of course, during my professional life, I've been helped. I've been inspired first by my mother. My mother was a teacher and then she became the head of her lycée and uh, she loved teaching. And uh, she always encouraged me uh, to pursue long studies, to develop in my professional life. And I think this is very important to feel supported by your own family whenever it's possible. Of course, in a, uh, I had mentors. In uh, mentors, there were two men, uh, two men, two professors of radiology who really helped me at the beginning of my uh, career, and uh, I really felt admiration for them. And this is uh, an important uh, thing to feel admiration and to be to well, uh, for persons belonging to a certain uh, professional sector. And they had built very uh, successful research teams and uh, I was proud to, proud to belong to these uh, teams. And they were open-minded and they gave uh, responsibilities and they gave me responsibilities and opportunities and they opened opportunities to me and to other 
women also. And I am convinced, as Adrienne has already said, that role models are, have really an important role in attracting girls to science and uh, research. Well, I brought you um, a photo of my role model. I don't, I don't know if you can see her. This is uh, um, Françoise Barré-Sinoussi. She is a great French virologist, and uh, she discovered, she co-discovered the HIV uh, virus, and she won the, she was awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, and um, she was interested in sciences from a very young age. And uh, after two years of studying sciences at the university, she decided to find a uh, a job in a laboratory to ensure that she had made the good, uh, right career choice. And uh, she was, uh, she found a part-time job at the Pasteur Institute and then she uh, quickly became full-time. And uh, what I like in uh, Françoise Barré-Sinoussi is that uh, she was successful in research but she uh, also uh, worked in developing uh, nations uh, with the World uh, Health Organization and, um, and uh, she collaborated scientifically with various countries through Africa and, um, and Asia. Well, what is important um, in, uh, in the when I in the nuclear sector, certainly uh, women are underrepresented in boards and in the nuclear sector. Uh, and uh, it is important to be able to attract young people. I think that most organizations now uh, know that a diverse workforce is necessary not for political reasons but because uh, this has shown to bring uh, effectiveness to bring performance and uh, and uh, women can bring their uh, are innovative and uh, this is important for all organization especially in the nuclear sectors well I, uh, well, several countries have uh, national policies uh, on gender balance, but to the best of my knowledge, I may be wrong, but there are no policies specifically targeting the nuclear sector. But I think that, uh, well, in France, for in that it could be interesting to specifically uh, propose, um, propose uh, to, to make proposals uh, to attract girls in the nuclear sector. And this could be done on, uh, on three, at three stages during, first during, uh, during, um, how do you say, at the school level, for example, and, and in order to present science and research to girls at, a very, at an early age, and uh, also to make efforts uh, to direct students to science at the university level by uh, letting students know about the diversity of the nuclear se sector, of, um, of um, the, all the different kind of posts that can be offered uh, and uh, by uh, by presenting the nuclear sector as a laudable uh, sector involved in uh, decarbonized uh, uh, heat uh, production, for example. And it is also important to promote women in workplaces by uh, probably by sustaining efforts uh, to, uh, to let them take responsibilities and by creating uh, more, uh, I'm more supportive family friendly, friendly environments 
with, for example, flexible working arrangements or childcare places. So I think we still have uh, many things to propose, many things to do to reverse the, the, the actual situation, which is not optimal regarding uh, the place of women in the nuclear sector. In the research sector, there are quite a lot of women, but that's true. They, Adrienne has said this. Uh, I think that there are about 25% professors, no more uh, in, my, um, in my discipline and uh, women are still underrepresented in leadership positions. Now this will be our struggle for the future. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. And we'll, we'll go to the last panelist uh, for in the leadership panel, which is uh, Marilyn Cray. And Marilyn and I have known each other for quite, um, quite a long time now. I, I was just thinking, Marilyn, that uh, when I was going to introduce you, I was going to mention that we maybe maybe the first time we interacted was on a program called Nuclear Power 2010. Back when 2010 was way into the future. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for making me feel so old. I appreciate that <laughs> immensely. And this this uh, panel, I'm actually getting so much out of this panel. I I would say uh, I think the future of nuclear is in great hands. Having listened listened to the the prior panel and then to be among just my esteemed colleagues on, on, on this one. So I, I think this, uh, I thank NEA for putting it together. And I will talk a little bit about the American Nuclear Society, but also my, I would say my day job, the, the group that pays me is Exelon Generation. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Development for Exelon. And kind of following from the first panel that, that approaches my career path, and you know, listening to that, I'd have to say that my career path and where I am now is not so much a result of deliberate planning on my part, but rather, I hate to say it, decisions that were made perhaps a little bit more on the reactive side. So I'm a, a chemical engineer, actually hail from the same school as, as Bill. Again, we, um, our, our connections go back uh, all the way there. When I graduated, we were, there was about less than 10% females in chemical engineering. And I'd be happy to say that my son recently graduated as a chemical engineer and it was 50-50. And so I was, I was very happy to see that. I had thought that I wanted to go into the, the um, oil industry, the petroleum industry, but graduating at that time, the, that industry had just gone through such a negative downturn that it was really somewhat devastating because there were no opportunities at that time. So I kind of, if you will, stumbled into nuclear. And the reason for that is that the Three Mile accident had happened just, it was actually when I was in high school or secondary school, and that had created so many opportunities, not just for women, but for others. So I was also drawn to the fact of working in Washington, D.C. So I hate to say it, but that those are the reasons that I, I got into nuclear, that I really didn't have a lot of other options at the time. And I really wanted to live in a, in a, in a city. So as it turns out, it's a good thing because I, I would say, you know, similar, I think, to Kate, uh, one of the first panelists, I, of course, was one of, of, um, of very few women there. And one of the more difficult things, I think, though, was, was the age issue. And when I worked for the NRC, it was in the headquarters and my counterpart, and so I was the regulator, but my counterpart was actually a mid-level licensing manager or director which was very difficult. So I'm sure that the gender piece had an aspect to it, but it was also more the fact that I, I, was, I was so young and actually put in that place. But again, the NRC at the time was growing, was trying to keep up. So it was not only recovering from the TMI accident, but it had a number of plants that it was trying to license. So in effect, it was a great, it was a great time of, of turmoil and chaos. It was really a good time to be there. I transferred within the agency to a regional office. And the reason for that is because I, I got married and my husband 
uh, I, 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 I chose to, to go with him. And that was, um, that was a great opportunity as an inspector. And again, that was very difficult, not only being an inspector, because as uh, my colleague from ONR can say, you know, that is, that is, that is a different role to be in. And, and so uh, I would say a lot has changed in the safety culture in the US, whereas back then there was some hostility, some animosity, it was a very difficult job. But it was a fantastic job because it had the best training program and qualification program that has benefited me throughout my career. So I am grateful for that opportunity. But I knew that I couldn't sustain that travel. Being a region-based travel or, uh, inspector required so much travel and I knew that was not going to fit into a lifestyle for a family. So that, again, I would say that was probably more of a female bias thing where I knew that it was gonna be my role to be a little bit more stable. Although my kids might question as to whether I really am that stable, but I, um, another opportunity arose, again, because of a bad event in our nuclear history, but the local utility operated a plant that was shut down by the regulator because operators were essentially sleeping in the control room. So that opened up an opportunity because then that, um, that utility was looking to hire, was looking to change its culture. So I made the move and I jumped over because of, because of that time. And that was a time of transformational change within that um, company. And that's the company that I'm with today. And that was a good thing because it, it basically gave me the courage to say, well, maybe my idea, it's not as if I joined a well-run company and that whatever was going on, my idea probably wasn't going to work. It was, it was, a, it was a great forum because I kind of knew that there were, that, that things needed to change. So I did that for a while, progressed through the engineering ranks. And then one of my biggest moves was I decided to, to, to leave nuclear, be within the company and go over to customer service. And the reason for that was because the customer service organization needed to improve. And so they were looking for people for, from nuclear. So it was a huge jump from a, um, a level with um, uh, just a, you know, an HR level. So that was a great thing. But also there, you know, there were some tremendous challenges. Uh, learned so much about the industry that I work in, but I also knew that my home belonged back in nuclear. So that was great because I was able to time when I wanted to come back. And I came back around the formation when our company was working really with British Energy to form Amergen. So we were buying plants. And it's, it's kind of a interesting piece that, that um, Three Mile Island, its sister unit, the non-accident unit, is the one that brought me back into nuclear. You know, TMI2 with the accident is the one that kind of created the opportunity in the first place. And then we went back, you know, in, in the year, in 1999, uh, I ended up buying and leading the effort to buy the, again, the non-accident sister unit. And that really launched a, a different um, aspect in my, in my career. And I thought at that point, I was almost 20 years in, but that's where I saw and had the better appreciation that I have now for the strategic value of nuclear. That is for the need for the fuel diversity, the renewables, the, 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 um, the still the fossil that we have, and also nuclear, understanding that, the, um, the environmental aspect of it, and so that, as Bill mentioned, that's when I, I um, started an organization or a con, uh, consortium, New Start, which we worked with Bill, who was then at our Department of Energy. Um, he had all of the policy and the programs within we which, within which we worked to license the, um, the first plant. And that's what really gave me the, I would say, the, the industry recognition and I launched that over now into what I'm doing, which is working with small modular reactors and advanced reactors. Again, working a lot now with, with um, uh, Bill's successors in, in the DOE. But that really, again, kind of fueled my passion for, for nuclear, which led me to have my current role also, which is concurrent actually with my, with my job, and that's serving as president of the American Nuclear Society. 
proud to say Fiona is on our board of directors. And the ANS is essentially the steward for our technology. And it's not just the electricity production, but it's all of the research, the standards in the medical community. And our role is really to, to help that the technology is understood as well as advocating for it. And on the understanding end, and which kind of ties into a lot of the comments I'm, I'm seeing in a lot of the um, previous speakers, one of our biggest programs is the navigating nuclear. And what we found is the best way, of course, the younger it is that you start, but you really need to start with the teachers and you need to arm them with the information. So ANS partnered with um, the Discovery Channel to develop a curriculum that starts out in the elementary school and then it goes to the middle, middle school and then ultimately to high school or uh, I think secondary school before they go off to university or college. So it's a, um, it spans the entire um, education for them and it brings in the, the nuclear facts. And I would say that discovery education is kind of the referee. So it allows only the fact piece, not the positive or the negative propaganda, if you will, associated with it. And they do that with all of the other industries as well. So that, and also, you know, the organizations, NAYGN, that's the North American Young Generation Nuclear. We work with them, and I believe that is a global one as well, and also women in nuclear. So working with them, the advocacy piece, we've actually found that the voice of women and the voice of younger people are more, I, I would say people are paying more attention to them or trusting more actually than what is the stereotypical middle-aged white man. So that's, that's, that's the piece I think that the diversity is actually playing in our favor. So I don't wanna go much over my time there, so I'll toss it back to, to you, Bill. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Thank you all for your opening comments. And uh, we've gotten a flood of questions um, from uh, from the audience. And let, let, let me let me um, start with this. I, I was listening carefully to the first panel, um, as as you were, and, and as you, as you all said, they were very impressive. Um, one one phrase that stuck in my mind was from Caitlin, who talked about how people saw her as a little girl in the big truck. Um, and now that you're, you're all in leadership positions, you're all you know, overseeing um, nuclear activities of one type or another, um, do you feel that that even still happens to you today to some degree? Do you feel like that some people see you as a little girl in the big truck, uh, Adrian? Adrian, you're muted, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it does still. Um... I'm fairly well recognized in this uh, industry now, but occasionally if I have my hard hat on or my PPE, uh, I am quite little. I don't know how, how tall you guys are, but I am short. And, and you get that. I've had that my whole career. Um, and I, I just think my mindset is that's really fun and a bit ridiculous. And yeah, it's my big truck. You're so jealous, aren't you? And, um, and I'm okay with that. I realize that other people feel differently. So I think what's important is to call things out when they are unacceptable, to call it out. And, and what I might say in that is say, do you know what, I think that's really kind of funny, but it probably suggests that you think this is odd and that might put other, other people off. How would your daughter feel about somebody saying something similar to her? So I think whatever our own tolerance is, we have to help people think through how we make whatever our industry choice is better for other people. Personally, I, I, have, I have been called a whole lot worse than a little girl in a big truck, I can tell you. and. Um, that's fine because if you do the right thing, if you lead by example, if you bring other people with you and you help elevate other people instead of putting them down, you will watch the people saying that float by you as their career dwindles and yours rises. Marilyn, it looked like you wanted to comment on that. No, I was just, actually, that was, that was uh, fantastic. I, I think I, I, I fully support that. And, and, and I, I think, you know, getting it's it's not as bad as it was but i wouldn't say it was so um it, it was more i try to think about where that 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 comment is coming from and and as i said when i started you know it was it was odd 
for somebody to be in that field. And so, and I, it's, that's kind of where they were coming from. But then if you see that that translates into, I'm not only surprised that you're here um, and surprised that you can do this, but that's okay. It's when then you're not given opportunities or things like that. But I also try to separate where um, some of the, where, where if it's coming from a negative piece or if it's just um, uh, an, an oddity, which, which again, statistically speaking, we are, we are outnumbered. Um, Mary Francis, do you want to comment on that or do you have something else? Uh, no, uh, well, well, I, yes, I support what, what, what has been said. Uh, I mean, um, it, probably uh, the meaning depends from, from uh, who said uh, this. And, uh, but I think that uh, anyway, people have globally uh, a very limited knowledge of the nuclear sector. And, uh, and uh, they sh we, we should give information on, on the sector because, uh, well, it is really uh, wider than I thought. It is, it has many different, many different uh, sectors, many very, very different activities. It offers very different jobs. So uh, yes, I, I think it's, it's important to show the diversity of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the activities. Let me follow up on that because um, I think it was Lucy that in the first panel that talked about the reaction that she gets from her friends when she talks about being in the nuclear industry. <laughs> and uh, let, let me let, let me start with Marilyn because Marilyn, you're you're now president of the American Nuclear Society, which is a very which is supposed to be the professional um, society promoting the nuclear discipline. Um, this that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Uh, when when the average person, your friends at cocktail parties give you that look when you say you're in the nuclear industry. That, is, is that part of the problem with, uh, with improving the gender balance? I, I, I always get that look. And I think probably all the panelists, when they say, oh, what, what, you know, what do you do? And, but I use that as, a, as a, a, a springboard, a platform to say, then they're kind of interested. And, and then it's, so how did you get involved in this? Or what did you, perhaps questions that they wouldn't, ask of my male colleague when he would say that he's in this nuclear field. So I use it as a as a as an opportunity to say why I got into it, why I'm still here and kind of what I'm doing. And it's 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 actually more of a positive um, uh, aspect. Adrian, as, as someone who's who's not a long term nuke, um, what, what's your thought about this? Because, you know, if you're trying to recruit uh, more young women to come into the nuclear field, but they're going in, thoughts about nuclear are so mixed, that doesn't that make the, the barriers very high to get more than in? Uh, I, I think it can be. Um, you know, all I would say is that with the right mindset and enough curiosity about what would attract people, then, you know, in my view, it is, it is possible to overcome that. The, the bigger challenge is the lack of women in the pipeline, uh, I think, and that's across all engineering roles. Therefore, we are, you know, essentially looking for the same resource. But from my perspective, nuclear has a very rich variety of roles in it. Not all are engineering based, like myself. I, I don't have that kind of technical background. My background is leadership and in culture. So, you know, I think when we consider the range of roles, then we draw in women wherever we can. I mean, my, my, my strong belief is that when you make organizations better for women, you make them better for everyone. The flexible working policies, the improved recruitment, the enhanced you know, equal pay that pays people fairly for the job, the on the job and off the job training, the leadership development, the opportunities. None of these things, I believe, will a man be sitting at home saying, I think that's a terrible idea because they're the same. This is about making organizations better and stronger through diverse teams. And therefore, for me, the inclusive workplace culture is essential. But I, I do think in terms of the, the nature of more of the technical professions, though, we need schools, we need universities, we need colleges, we need parents to do more. And I saw that in a number of the comments, actually. I'm, I'm really heartened to see that. 
because I think there is a PR issue. And another one of those comments is, you know, dangerous for people to work in nuclear. And you know, my view as a regulator on that is, is pretty strong. You know, far fewer people are injured or die in a nuclear site anywhere in the world um, than they do in, in regular construction or in working on roads. So I feel that the standards of regulation are so high here, frankly, because the stakes are so high, that it is a, certainly a physically safe role. The next thing then I, I start to think about is, is it psychologically safe? And I think that's where it's harder for people to work through. But, you know, again, is this a career I want to be in? Do I feel valued? You know, am I enjoying my work? Do I have opportunities? These are the same in nuclear as they are in other sectors. So when it comes to that kind of physical and psychological safety, I see no reason why nuclear can't be, so long as there's good regulation. Obviously, I would say that. But I, I really passionately believe it. And, and I always say the biggest barrier, I know there are organizational barriers, but the biggest barrier is us. It's that little bird that sits on our shoulder and taps us with self-doubt. It's that little bird that says, you don't meet all the criteria. You're not that special. You're not good enough. And that's an internal driver. That's not the world throwing that at me. And it, they, I will be 50 years of age this year. I still feel that imposter syndrome. And I talk a lot about that with the people I'm mentoring. So I think we just need to recognize that it's there and encourage people to have the courage to step out of their comfort zone. If you come into nuclear and you don't like it, you can leave. There are no handcuffs in these jobs. What's the worst that can happen if you give an amazing career a try? Well, it is, it, um, Mary French, you, you had mentioned the, um, the work that, that IRSN has done to create a more uh, family-friendly environment. Um, yes. Or a, a, I guess with childcare options, things like this. Do, how do you think that plays into this? Is that is that part of what Adrian's talking about, creating the environment where women can be successful, continue in careers? Well, I think I think um, there are probably uh, many um, many points, many different points of view. I think first that uh, to increase the number of women, we should meet the expectations of women and uh, we have first to gather information from women at work now and from students what they would like for them for the future we have to hear what the young generation would like and this is probably different uh, from what we liked in the uh, in our generation uh i mean the uh it is common belief that uh, uh that women will uh, probably interrupt their careers for taking care of their families or that they will work part-time during their career and this probably is, uh and we have to reverse this trend or to make it uh, compatible with, uh, to include it within a professional career. And that's uh, why, uh, yes, in, I think it, uh, organizations, yes, should uh, listen to women, to what they want, to what they would like to have, and uh, to meet their expectations. If uh, women need, uh, need to be accompanied, to take care of, I mean, to places uh, to take care of their children when they are at work. Yes, we have to think of this. Uh, it should be discussed as an investment, as other investments in uh, to have a, a good quality of life uh, during in uh, in workplaces. Yeah, I think so. But generally speaking, I, I, regarding the nuclear sector and Marilyn and Adrian have, have already said many important things. I, um, I think that there are there is also information that and or uh, yes information that is needed to the general uh, population. I mean, uh, yeah, because some of them have uh, a negative 
view of uh, their sector. It's a little bit, um, I mean, they haven't, they don't know the sector much. It's, uh, it's a lack of information and uh, it's a received, uh, they are received ideas. We have to, uh, to, to, to transform their way of thinking regarding uh, the sector and to show yes to show the importance of your regulation uh, the investment of people who who have well uh, yes uh, the investment of people that and uh, things are evolving the high standards of quality and and so on so let me let me follow up on that and this 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 sounds very much like what adrian was talking about when she said what's you know, even if you're not sure you like nuclear, what's the worst that can happen if you move in a career direction? It, 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 since the IRSN and um, ONR both have regulatory responsibilities, um, we, we actually had this question as to, do you really have to like nuclear to, to work in organizations like that to be successful? You don't have to be pro-nuclear to work uh, at IRSN, right? No. Do you, do you want to react to that? Uh, sorry, what did you say? We don't have. So you, you don't. You don't have to like nuclear to to enjoy working at IRSN or. No, or no. Netherlands. Well, IRSN is a is an organization with two uh, different type of activities: expertise and research. So research is very diverse, and uh, and uh, what is interesting is that the uh, the two uh, sectors of activities have links and interact. And uh, yes, of course. I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, we do the best to uh, well to in France to make uh, to make this the the sector to make uh, uh, the nuclear field the safest as possible, and to um, and to promote research to uh, decrease the. Uh, uh the side effects of uh of ray of, of radiation yeah um let, let me let me ask a big question because in a few minutes in a couple of minutes i'll ask the other panelists to join us what why is this important what why should anybody care about gender balance um and particularly in a nuclear field why 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 spend time on it <laughs> <laughs> I get that question from time to time. I'm just I'm wondering what your answer is. I'll, I'll, you, I'll go for a real, a real basic thing. First of all, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Secondly, diverse teams are much more effective. And thirdly, in nuclear, we need the best possible teams at every table, not just the top table, every table. So that diversity of thinking is going to spot problems. It is going to keep people safer. And it's going to produce a better product that is better for the bottom line. What is not to love about diversity? Marilyn, do you want to react to that? Yeah, I mean, abs abs absolutely. And, and I, I like, you know, so panelists talked before a little bit about it. So there is the gender piece. And that's the great thing. The biggest thing I think that Adrian was saying is that diversity of thought, whether you came from perhaps you know, an R&D background, or you came from another industry, or you came from some that you want to bring all of that to the table. From a gender balance perspective, that's focusing on you have a, 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 veil, a set of available resources in front of you. If, if you're any kind of, a, a, if you're a leader in an organization, or you have this, this population of the community from which you can recruit, why would you say, well, I'm only going to take half of what I could otherwise take because I have this gender balance, that you would you would look at all of them and you would take that top talent. And, and that's the piece that says, you know, just from a common sense perspective, why would I want to, to take only people from this or not from that? And, and it, it, it is just maximizing the resources that you have available to you, bring them in, and then you have that community where you can, in fact, have that diversity of thought and that challenge and all of that that, that I think has just proven that how an organization or entity is going to, to, to excel by, the, by those different opinions. Mary France, would you like to weigh in on that one? 
Ah, uh, this is another answer <laughs> that you need the uh, gender balance. I mean, it's uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's a general aspiration of most societies uh, all around the world. It's a question of uh, how do you say justice? Is justice of equality? I think well, this is the main reason uh, women are talented. Women are talented, including in sciences, uh, and uh, what. Why shouldn't you uh, use the uh, all the uh, all the qualities of all the uh, all that uh, the whole talent of women? That, that would be uh, nonsense. And uh, well, uh, it has been shown that uh, that uh, organizations include uh, that uh, that have a. Um, uh, where uh, women are uh, represented, have better performance. They reflect uh, in their goals, in their objectives. They reflect uh, the um, the feeling of the society more precisely. Uh, I think it's important for the nuclear sector. Well, well, let me invite Fiona and the other panelists to join us at this point. Um, if you all could come on on camera and um, as you're coming on let me ask let me ask the question that we've gotten from the audience which I think is very interesting and that is um, the, the person the person who asked the question is making the observation that um, many of the women that they interact with and many of you that, that, who have spoken today are in what what this person referred to as a non-operational positions, um, environmental monitoring, safety um, training, research, as opposed to the positions related to design, construction, operation, and and this person wonders: is there also is there an unconscious bias inside the nuclear sector um, that we're not even really thinking about, where we see women taking one type of position? Uh, within the nuclear sector as technical specialists uh, as opposed to others and and certainly um, one area where I know there's been a significant imbalance um, for, for a long time is in nuclear operations nuclear operators in control rooms um, in many places are is, is almost impossible to find women in, in some of the teams I think it's gotten better in recent years but I know that's an area um, so I'll open that up to see if anybody wants to comment on that. Is, is there a, is there a, is there a bias inside that? Please, Marilyn. Yeah, I, I will start in, in, so my company, uh, the company for which I work, Exelon, we operate 22 reactors across the United States. So the, we are trying desperately to bring more women into operations and um, I would say that from my personal experience, after having gone through simulator training, that's where my draw was, was to be a control room operator. And I consciously just chose not to because of the demands on the shift work, um, the divorce rate. If you look at the divorce rate of uh, control room operators, I haven't looked recently, but that's very high. So we have tried to help with that lifestyle. And I think as Adrian had said before, you know, you help women, you help everybody. We have tried to have different, to, to go to 12 hour shifts, to do things like that. But it is still, you know, at the end of the day, there, there, there is a difference between sometimes the role that you play if you're going to be a parent in this, especially if you want to have the children. So, you know, we've had uh, women go through who are, are pregnant and, um, and and then you know you're forced to take a little bit of time off time off it's a very difficult thing and i would say it's more the coming from a lot from the person um trying to change the policies and to create that more welcoming environment but it is a very tough job for anybody well, let me ask uh, let me direct this more at, and, and fiona maybe you, you can comment us on the web but direct this at the at the young panel and fiona um, as you hear this, and you're at the point in your careers where um, you are still early enough that you can make different choices, and so the issue of retention uh, for people like you comes up, and we often hear how um, 
women when they reach a certain point in their careers, it just gets to be too difficult and they go do something else as opposed to stay in the nuclear track. Um, is there, do you feel, any, do you feel is anything that is happening at this point in your careers where you might have to make a decision to go do something different as opposed to stay in the kind of nuclear sector you are? Anyone want to comment on that? And I think that while people are thinking about that, um, I guess a key thing to explore is the, the concept that we talked about previously around being in your comfort zone. And um, a lot of this comes back to whether you are um, comfortable moving away from your comfort zone. And, and part of that comfort zone is not just about what you know intellectually or what you're able to do from your capability point of view. It's about your comfort zone in terms of who you're socializing with and what you actually have to do when you actually go into that workspace. If you're going into that workspace and you are surrounded by a number of other people who are not like you, um, then that can be a bit of a challenge. If you're having to do that every single day and you do that as well outside of the workplace, that can be a bit of a challenge. Some of, some of this is actually about you know, your comfort zone and how you take that forward. And maybe actually for all of us, changing the environment so that the comfort zone is actually a different environment to be in. So I pose that, but I, I'll let our young panel to comment because I, I really can't comment from a youngster's point of view. We're all looking at you. Get out of your comfort zone, say something. <laughs> yes, Anastasia. Um, yeah, a little bit on this issue. Um, the statistics shows us that women perform uh, sometimes even better than men in STEM subjects at universities and schools. But after graduation, at some point of their um, at some point of their career, where when they should make a choice, they choose different. Uh, subject different fields not nuclear and not technical I think it's because of the some difficulties that uh, they think they encounter in terms of um, combination of family lives taking care of children taking care of elderly people and this is especially true uh, in the current situation uh, we're all under quarantine and every uh, family member is at home so uh, women should be at work at the same time uh, being a good mother take care of elderly people and I think the, the decision how to solve this is to create more gender flexible policies and flexible um, working environment for women in, in, order, in order to build trust that they uh, they um, they can um, take care of the children and at the same time um, be leaders and professionals and uh, develop their careers. So it, it's the, the, and the, the, word, the word has come up a couple of times in the conversation one way or the, the children issue, um, which, which I think, um, you know, I think many of you know, we, we've run um, three of these uh, international mentoring workshops in Japan. Um, and we've done some other countries too, but we've done three in Japan and we meet with these uh, high school girls and they're, you know, 15 or 16, very, very mature uh, girls. Um, and the, this issue about, well, how do you make this work? You know, how do you make, how do you make being a, a wife and mother and also being a scientist working in a nuclear insulate? How does that all work? How do you make that? How do you bring all that together? Isn't that really hard to do? And, um, and so that creates a lot of dialogue with our mentors. And, I, I'm, and, and is, is that really the sort of a core issue in this, in your minds, anyone who wants to comment on this? Is that, is that maybe one of the real social barriers, the, the role of women and, and family that is really at the, at the heart of this? Uh, um, Mary no, yeah, I think, oh, sorry. I think, okay. it, I think it, it uh, yes, it's probably uh, an important issue and a barrier, yes, but uh, well, it should be taken into account in general uh, national policies uh, to help young young uh, women uh, to um, to be uh, to 
to stay, uh, yes, to, to go on with their jobs and not leaving their jobs when they, when they have children. But I think we could be inspired also by other sectors. Uh, I, uh, I think, for example, of the air hostesses, uh, they are frequently away from their home. It's a little bit the same in, uh, for uh, health workers. So, uh, I mean, um, uh, there should be a balance between, uh, the, um, between what, is, uh, what is requested to uh, women, in, uh, to women at their, in at the workplace, uh, if they work uh, all day long or at night, and the advantages they get from this. Anyone else want to comment on that, Fiona? So I think some of this as well is actually around the, the wording that we use um, in terms of you know what we're actually asking people to do. Um, so for example, we used to talk a lot about maternity leave. Yeah. And then we started talking about paternity leave. And actually now we're talking about parental leave. And when you start using different words, um, people start to act in a different way. Um, and I think we need to think about that. I think we have to think about the fact that, um, yes, things happened in a particular way in the past. That doesn't mean to say that it's always going to have to be that way. Um, you know, things have changed now. And so I think we have to think about the words we use as we actually talk about what we're actually doing for a more flexible workplace and enabling parents to come back to work. Um, I think that's that's very important. Marilyn, let me let me ask let me ask you this question. Um, so, because I, I agree with what what Fiona said, um, but that's a societal issue, um, which means, which and if that were the case, that was the the key issue. Wouldn't the proportion of women in leadership positions and technical positions be the same in nuclear as it is in other disciplines? But it's not. Nuclear actually does show um, a deficit in these areas. So what is it? This what is it about the nuclear industry that's different? And, and Adrian is going to take this away from you if you don't say something really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she could do a better job. Well, there is something intimidating about our industry, and that's that's the other piece that I think we have to be we, we have to go out there more to to dispel that that concern. Or like I saw one of the comments. And I've had that, like, well, aren't you afraid to go to work? It's like, of course not. And here's why. And so I think that that piece of it plays into the the, the issue that we have with our industry in, in general. And again, I'm, I'm referring more to the, the commercial nuclear power industry. So we have that industry, or I'm sorry, that issue. And then the, the gender piece, I think, just amplifies that issue by, by keeping perhaps more, more women out of it. But the more of us that are out there and in front of it, whether it's as leaders, as new entrants into the career, um, trying to dispel that myth about what it might be to work in a nuclear power plant, I, I think the more that we do that, the better it is for the industry because we bring in more women and more qualified men who might want to, to partake. Um, I'm, I'm going to let Adrian comment on this, but I also want to give a warning to uh, Caitlin and and Danielle that you're going to have to ask the leadership panel a question when I when I get when after Adrian's done. So Adrian, please. So I think we've got a couple of issues, and it's it's a compound problem because the industry is much more male dominated. We tend to have more males writing policies, who are not curious enough about what it's like to have a different perspective. We also have more older men writing policies. So we lack, I think, a, a younger perspective as well as a female perspective. So the dominance of, I think, the engineering brain in this sector is that policies are written to fix problems, not to create opportunities. So we've got to get different folk who are curious about different stuff, back to that cognitive diversity, thinking of what the actual thing is we're trying to do with policies. Is it to make sure women can legally come back without suing us after having a child? Or is it actually about having a workforce that can go to their kids' sports days, that can look after their ailing parents and still show up for work somehow? And I can tell you, I think this pandemic is going to push 
so many policymakers and leaders out of their comfort zones by, by having people be able to say, we don't need to do it like this anymore. And I'm going to be the first one running up that pole with my team asking them, how do we make this better and easier for you to exceed as my team and be fantastic parents and community people? That's what I want for everybody. Uh, the, the, we actually did have a couple of questions about the effect of the of the pandemic. I'm going to aim this at, uh, at Mary France and Fiona in, in just a minute. But uh, in a sense, uh, Caitlin and Danielle have these burning questions uh, for the leadership panel. I'll start with Caitlin and see what questions she's come up with. Thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight the importance of male mentors and male champions of women in STEM, such as yourself. Um, my father always pushed me to do my best and take on challenges and never told me I couldn't do something because I was a girl. Uh, my best friend growing up was a boy and my closest cousins were male. And I find the support from all these people in my life really shaped my confidence and enabled me to believe in myself. Uh, and I've also had a lot of support from male supervisors and colleagues. Uh, so my question to the panel is, <laughs> as female leaders, uh, in the field, how are you going to help get more men on board with this initiative? And how do you think we can go about doing that as a group? It's a great question. Who wants to take it on? Mary France, do you want to do you want to take uh, that could one? Could you repeat it? How, how can we how can we get more female? More men. More how men. How we get more men? More men to. To, to take this issue of encouraging women, um, take, have them become more better uh, I think, leaders in that area? Well, I think um, it, it should uh, begin early. <laughs> I think it's probably a matter of educate. I think it's a matter of education uh, since the early age. Uh, uh, probably uh, uh, by uh, by telling well by by boys having the same I mean by having the same attitudes with boys uh, compared with the attitudes that we have with girls and uh, uh, and uh, at home and at school also and uh, by not trying to direct girls to social uh, types of, uh, of work, uh, health or teaching, for example, but just let them what they want to do. And uh, if they are good at sciences, then uh, they, should, they could uh, um, embrace uh, scientific careers. So that's uh, the first thing. Second thing, I think uh, maybe informa I mean uh, information to uh, to bed is also important. Uh, they probably uh, don't. Um, I mean, uh, they don't. I mean, uh, just uh, how would you say? Just uh, men who um, uh, they could be. They could. Uh, we. I, I saw one uh, once a film. I don't know if it was at the uh, NEA or somewhere else. Uh, a man um, in, the, uh, in the place of a woman, and uh, he. Well, he felt what a woman could uh, could feel. So I think that uh, well, we could. We could. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of education and probably of information. Please, Fiona. I think when it comes to having the, the dialogue around whether you have a male or a female mentor, I think it's actually more fundamental than that. I think the mentor-mentee relationship is an important one. And it's around the personality. Um, the mentors that I have had in my life, male and female, who have enabled me to be successful, they got me. They understood me. They understood what I was about and what I was trying to achieve. And I got them. And so it's about bringing that personality match together. And that could be male or female. So I think that's the important thing. It's actually to get the right personality match. Okay, excellent. Um, 
Yeah. So, so Danielle, what's your what's your question? Hi. Um, my question would be, um, in my experience, um, for, for women who are going back to the having children um, issue, that women are viewed as quite equal when it comes to opportunities and and in the workplace until it gets to that stage where um, people start having families. Um, even you know i've spoke to women who are extremely good at their job um uh, really well thought of but they just not want to be viewed for progression in their career um because they're seen as having an eye off the ball if you like a, an eye on the home life rather than being focused at work um my question would be is there anything we can do as women in the nuclear industry to kind of like change that mindset um, or do you think it has to come from, you know, the management of companies? Who wants to take that one on? Uh, okay. Marilyn? Yeah, I was going to say, Danielle, and, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing, and, and again, I'm, I'm actually quite envious. My, again, my kids are now, my kids are 28 and 31 years old. And it was very difficult back then. Um, be, but in the biggest change, aside from, from what you could say the societal, the culture things, was the policies and the programs. So Fiona mentioned, you know, we no longer have maternity leave, maternity leave. we now have the family, family leave is what we, we call it. And that idea that, that the raising children is a shared piece, to me, that's a, that's a cultural change. We have um, uh, all of our young fathers um, the statistics are, are just crazy about how many of them are taking advantage of the company's policy for family leave, which is actually more generous than what I think is required by, by law. But there appears to be this change where there's this shared ownership and responsibility for that. And that's having a, a significant um, impact on it. And Again, it's when you foster, I think, through company or organizational policies that you're essentially saying, hey, this is out there and there's no stigma uh, associated with a, a young dad who's taking off because he has a, a, a new child. Um, and that that's it's it's been slow in coming. But as I said, I'm just very, very grateful and happy that, that that things are changing perhaps they're not where they need to be but when i look back as to how how it was you know really being on maternity leave was actually called disability um when when you when i when i had my kids and so you were it was it was just a a very different time and i i think that the whole societal change of that um wanting to have more time, more work-life balance, and the way when those translate into actual organizational policies and, and uh, programs that, that that helps significantly. So the more as leaders, we can foster those, monitor how they're being implemented, change and adjust them as needed, then that just makes a, a healthier company organization and, and moreover society. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Um, we, we talked a lot about this role model issue, um, and, and this is something that I do think is important. You know, at the um, at, at the NEA, for example, you might notice in the background, this is my, my main conference room. I'm not actually in it, it's a virtual uh, picture. But on the back, you'll see a picture of uh, Lise Meitner, um, who is famous for uh, being a participant in the experiments that basically established fission. And um, among the scientists that, that did this work, she was the only one not to get the Nobel Prize. And so everyone, I think the whole, I think in physics, it's one of those, those sort of sins that people have carried around as physicists for all of these years, because everyone knows at least Meitner should have got the Nobel Prize. So, but she, she didn't get the Nobel Prize, but she's got my conference room. Um, and when I look at people like Lise Meitner, um, who are these tremendous figures, um, we went through an exercise to build our conference rooms, and we have uh, different conference rooms dedicated to different women scientists. And I realized as we were populating these conference rooms, I didn't know anything about any of them. 
I, I was amazed when I found out who they were and what they'd accomplished. Um, do we do we do a bad job of promoting women as role models, as figures? I mean, we hear Marie Curie a lot, but beyond that, in the nuclear area, you don't hear that many names. Uh, is this something that we just we we need to do a better job of just promoting women as role models, as figures, both living and not living? Anyone want to yes. comment on that? Yes. We do a bad job. Adrian, answer the question. <laughs> yeah, but but I think it goes back to Danielle's point there. You know, when you ask what can you do, which I really like, you know, it's not because it's a bit too big, isn't it? We think we have to fix society, or we have to fix the world, or sometimes even mm. have to fix an organization. It just feels exhausting. Um, and therefore, I think all we can do is fix ourselves. And and for my money, in this sector, I have quite a you know, a relatively proactive social media uh, profile. If you if you look me up, you will see nothing about my personal life unless somebody's leaked a photo from a holiday somewhere. You know, I, I'm actually quite a private person. But at work, what this job needs is profile. What this job needs is publicity. And I'm fortunate to work with people like Sam Nouri, uh, one of my amazing inspectors, who's got two um, now not quite so young children, but who's come back you know, through maternity twice, got her sleeves rolled up, been open with us about what she needed so we could keep her in in the tent and then come out and uh, you know sort of keep her in the organization and come out and then go back again and then start again i'd rather keep really great people even a little bit of the week than lose them for the whole week so that's common sense to me but the reason i connect this to the point about role modeling is sam is the face of some of our recruitment campaigns that i mentioned earlier we don't just dole out a boring job description but she has had to step up our company branding is full of faces of people who work for us. They're real people. They're not stock images. Most of them don't want their picture in our corporate plant. But I ask them to do it because it's important for others. I ask them to share their stories. So I think the biggest thing we can do is recognize that it's not people like me or Fiona who are the role models. It's, it's you guys. You embracing this space. You talking about successes. You saying how you've nailed it, what you've done how you're making things work in a conversational tone that is accessible to other people. That's how we promote role models because I'm never going to be a Marie Curie. You know, I haven't got those kind of brains in my life, but I think if we can all just help each other a little bit, we, we help create the conditions for the next Marie Curie to be properly recognized. And that's really important. I think for us. Excellent. Thank you. Fiona, I'm sorry. Yeah. Fiona, you had a comment. Just to say that I think this this challenge and the answer is yes, we do a bad job, um, but it's not just in nuclear. Um, it's actually in, in, in engineering and science in general. Um, and and I think that the other point is that it's not just about women in engineering and science. Um, we are bad, basically, overall in terms of engineers and scientists promoting themselves because that that's just it's we're doing other things. It's not kind of like in the psyche. So I think we need to get around that and, and just look at how we help each other out in terms of actually enabling that visibility. And social media today is a great way of doing that. We have that available to us. And, um, and the current situation that we're in has meant that a lot of us have had to learn an awful lot more about how you use these interesting platforms that are available. So, you know, we should see something better at the other side of it as a result of that, in my view. Well, I appreciate that. We're believe it or not, we're we're running out of time. Uh, I'll just I'll make we one thing I would have liked to spend more time talking about was um, the university's role in all this, and I'm sure Mary France would have had a lot to add on this, but I think we won't have time to get into that. But I will note that one of the activities the NDA is engaging in right now is creating something that would eventually be called the Global Forum on Nuclear Education, and we're going to use that as a platform to work with universities around the world. And one of the things that we intend to deal with is this issue of, of gender balance. And that's something that, that professors we've talked to are very interested in. Um, but in the last uh, few minutes, I think I'll give um, really each of the panelists um, 30 to 40 seconds to make some final comments. And I'm going to start with the young panel and uh, give Anastasia the first one. So Anastasia, the floor is yours for the next 30 to 40 seconds. So um, I'm really great that I, I was able to take part in such a great event and I've gained so much inspiration and excitement and I think events like this one will be a turning point for many women to start their STEM or nuclear career. So thank you all for your stories. 
Thank you very much. Lucy. Um, I want to thank you, all of you. It was very interesting. And it's the first time I share my experience like this. And I really enjoyed this time with you. Thank you very much. Danielle? You're muted, Danielle. Sorry, apologies. Um, yeah, just thank you for letting me be part of today. Um, I would say that it's important that that we talk about our mentors and people that have helped us along the way to, to kind of like do that as we progress for other people. Um, and it's important to, you know, help people as much as you can. Um, but yeah, and today's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us, Caitlin. I just want to say thanks for having me and thank you to all the other panelists for sharing their stories. Um, I just wanted to bring up again the role of men in all of this uh, and to thank the men who are on our side on this issue and also to invite all of the participants and panelists and viewers to consider inviting your male friends, your male colleagues, your dad, your grandpa, the people that are already on your side to participate in these kinds of things. And I think that'll help make a difference. Oh, excellent, thank you for the comment. All right, now, uh, Mary France, if you'd like to make a, a closing comment. You're, you're still muted. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, all and to thank uh, the NEA for organizing this uh, web, chat, web chat. I think uh, it was a very good and uh, useful initiative. I was happy to share views with all uh, of you. And I hope uh, we have uh, contributed uh, uh, to build a more diverse uh sector uh and i yeah thank you thank you very much marilyn yeah thank you for that you know this has been a great panel i i am just energized by that that first panel with the the enthusiasm and and just the grace and 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 just just uh think it it bodes incredibly well for our future and i'm just in awe of my of my fellow panelists so you know i think this is a fan fascinating industry i am so proud to work in it and i think that the people my colleagues my my international colleagues not just my female ones I, I just think that there is something about the nuclear industry. We need to attract more, but those we attract has um, those that, but those that we are attracting uh, are, are, are just a great community to be in. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, for the career opportunities I've had. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, and uh, Adrian. Yeah, Adrian, you're muted. Sorry, we, one of us should figure out how to press the mute button, shouldn't we? Um, just, I, I know we can't see them, but I've been on and off screen reading all the comments in and I'm really frustrated that we couldn't answer all of those, but it really does show how much interest there is in this from, you know, people who are, I can see from the, from the backgrounds, long-term nuclear advocates, you know, long-term careers with people who are new in and people who are anti-nuclear as well. So it's been great to at least have a diverse listenership. Uh, I mean, the three things for me, you know, I've said your comfort zone is not your friend. We have to get out of our own comfort zones to help others get out of theirs. And, and that leadership, by example, is critical if we want to change things. Secondly, role models do change the world. We have no right to expect other people to role model for us if we're not prepared to role model for them. So I think there is a leadership role. I love that comment earlier. Leadership is not about hierarchy. It is about mindset and it is about attitude. And we have it in all of us. And the third thing I leave with is, is again, my, my strong belief across many sectors, an inclusive world. When we imagine that inclusive world, it's better for everyone, not just women. Great comment. 
And um, I, 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 as uh, Adrian noted, we, we have a huge number of questions that we could have asked. We just don't have the time. Um, I guess we'll just have to do this again, Fiona, um, and, and, and have another discussion like this. Um, it, you know, this issue of gender balance is something that the NEA is working on. We have um, an ad hoc group of people from around the world who are participating in the conversation. Uh, Fiona is, is chairing that, so I think we, we will like to do this. And, and next time, Fiona, I think something we definitely will have to do is to, is to make sure we have people from Asia and Latin America as well. We, we, we got a little culturally narrow here uh, just because of the way this came together. But uh, next time, I think we'd like to get some more uh, diversity. But I'd like to give you the last substantive word. So like everything, I'm going to do the last word and then I'm going to say a little bit as well, if that's okay. So the last word is wow. Please. Um, and today, wow is about women optimizing the workplace. Okay, that's the last word. In terms of, um, so that was the discussion today. And then in terms of um, just some last remarks, look, um, I think we've heard that a diverse workforce under the right leadership will optimize performance. And today, hopefully you have seen that, you know, that we have a thought provoking, communic communicative, I even say it, knowledgeable, passionate, intelligent ladies here um, who are all role models in their own right. Um, so let's, let's do something here and let's remove this gender parity issue um, for once and for all. And we'll do that together, not just with females talking to each other, but with everybody talking to each other about how we actually create thought diversity for our future nuclear workplace. Well, it's a great way to end it. And Fiona, thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. You did a fantastic job today. It's been great talking with you. And uh, particularly to the young panel, um, we think the future is in good hands with, with, with you four. You, you did a great job today. You all seem very highly motivated. I appreciate all your comments. Um, I will uh, just note that um, this was recorded and will be available on the NEA website in the coming days. So if uh, you know people who missed it, want to see it, it will be available for viewing. And um, I want to thank all of you who watched this. There was over 400 people who were in the audience and sent in comments and questions. And I really apologize for not being able to get through all the questions. It just, there's just never enough time for these things. Uh, but keep your eye on the space. We will do this sort of thing again. Um, and next, and next month, we'll probably have at least two web chats on different subjects uh, with, uh, with global leaders and with, with others um, to talk about important issues of the day. But um, for this panel, which was excellent, um, again, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for all the, the audience. And uh, thank you to the staff uh, who put this together um, for making this very successful. And with that, um, I will hand it, I think I hand it back to Andrew for any closing. I'm, all right, so, so we're done. So thank you very much for being with us and enjoy the rest of your day.